In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In my sermons, I always start by meditating on the assigned readings of the week. We have a lectionary that is very old, and I try to find the Holy Spirit's inspiration and in how it relates to my life and to yours. But this week, I wasn't finding inspiration in that same way. But yet, yesterday I did a spirit-filled baptism of little Teddy Shot Nazarian, the newest uh, grandson of Michael and Jean. And then a couple weeks still stuck with me the wedding of Armand and Rebecca Tigranyan, which was similarly spirit-filled. I found inspiration in these sacraments, and it's not a surprise, because a sacrament in the Armenian church, it means mystery, but really what it is, is it's a window to God's movement. There's um, a way that through sacraments we encounter God and feel his movements more clearly. So coming off that, I found that what I talked about at both this baptismal and wedding sacrament is something worth sharing with you about how to better find God in the Armenian church. And that is this, that the nature of our faith is greater than words. Now, I've preached a lot about this in this sense. I've told you a hundred times that you can't grasp a mystery, you can only be grasped by it. That is a principle of Orthodox Christian faith, that whatever you say, whatever you think about God, if God is God, he's way beyond that, okay? But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about how God is beyond words. I'm going to talk about how our worship operates powerfully without words, before words, pre-verbal, that worship in the Armenian church uses images and symbols and movements which we read without words and point us closer to our greatest joy and highest calling in Christ. I started thinking about this because at Armand and Rebecca Tigranyan's wedding, they helped me to think about it. Their wedding was wonderful. They're a very special couple in many ways. One way is that they know their Bible and that they spent lots of time worshiping God in English-speaking churches. And so when I told this couple and tried to go very slowly with them and say, you know, you have to meet with me three times uh, before you get married and we'll talk about God and your marriage, they said, well, perfect timing. We're done with our 11-week Bible study on Christian marriage. So they were ready. And this couple wanted to understand everything in our church, our church marriage service, in English, and know its significance biblically. And they also wanted all their guests who were from that church to understand and participate. Great, we did this. And for the first time ever, we translated the entire wedding service, hymns and all, and had it in the pews for people to follow along. And this was wonderful, and it's very important. But I also warned Armand and Rebecca and all of their family and friends at the rehearsal. I said, if you just read the words in the Armenian church, you get about half of what is going on. Sacraments in the Armenian church also work on a pre-verbal level. Remember that this church never participated much in the Enlightenment Reformation project of making everything into words and accessible to the mind. We were on the outskirts of that. We dipped our toe into that. And remember also this, for the biggest part of our history, people couldn't read who came to church. And so how do you learn about Christ if you can't read? The Gospels are read out loud to you. That's one thing. But more importantly, you read the stories and all the pictures and all the movements 
and all the symbols of the church. That's how you learn about Christ. And in the same way that words can point you beyond words to Christ, so can the rituals, the symbols, the movements of the church. And so Armand and Rebecca, these crowns of marriage you're wearing aren't just beautiful props that look very good in photos. They bring you into God's story as a king and a queen of your new family. And bowing forehead to forehead with those crowns, joined at the head by the cross, this says the exact same thing without any words that Paul said in Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. The same was the case with yesterday's baptism. In our church, we don't just say we should turn away from evil and turn our lives to God. We act it out. And so we started the baptism as we start every morning service, raising our hands, looking to the west, and saying, God, protect this family from evil and this child. And then we turn to the light of the knowledge of God and saying, Bormutan as Durinko Batsmes, dare open to us, Lord, the gates of your mercy as we approach the lighted altar. And most poignantly, led by the four very bright but not yet literate children at yesterday's baptism, we meditated on these two great icons of our church. And I share this with you so it can be your wordless meditation every time you enter this church. First comes the icon of the baptism of Christ on your left. This icon reminds us of who made us, to whom we belong, and where we're ultimately headed. Now the world seems to think that a child arises from their parents and belongs to them. Our faith reminds us that no one really has any idea of the mystery of life and how it comes to be, and that our parents are stewards of their children. But this is all a great gift of God, and through baptism we give thanks and offer our child and our life back to God. And we also acknowledge that just like Jesus Christ, our highest calling in a heavenly kingdom is realized by our living and moving in him. And so following Jesus, we're baptized and then begin our lives ministry, giving our lives in service to God and fellow man. And so every time you come in church, I hope that you meditate on that icon which has the Trinity and many other symbols of our faith reflected so you know where you came from, to whose you belong, and where we're going. But now then, look at this icon on your right, the baptism of King Dertat and Queen Ashren, where Christ's baptism reminds us of where we're from and where we're going. This icon gives us a sense of what we do in the meantime on our way there. This is the story of how Dertat, the king of Armenia, repented from his sin, was baptized, and along with his queen, Ashren, set to work to create a Christian people, translating the Gospels, building churches, orphanages, and schools. And so many people think our Armenian Christian heritage is some ancient one-time deposit of God that we have to do everything in our power to protect and preserve forever. That's a small part of it. The bigger truth is that what God did with Dertat and Ashen is what God wishes to do to every single one of us today. That's why many of you were crowned in marriage and were tasked as king and queen of your families to create a Christian family at home, translate and speak the Gospels in your language at home, to build your home and church into the dwelling place for God. And if you aren't married, or you weren't born into this church, then you're like Gregory, also not married, also not Armenian. And you are called to enlighten everyone you know in this church, your neighbors, colleagues, and friends, with your shining example of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. So I could go on for a long while discussing the movements, symbols, and architecture icons of our church but I just wanted to focus on these select icons and symbols of our church to remind you that while words and understanding are, are necessary and they're important, faith in the Armenian church also works 
on another level. A faith before words if you're attuned to it. And so when you come to worship in church, don't just read the words that point you to God. Read the icons and the symbols and the movements of our worship and most importantly, read yourself into the story of God. A story which is told with words, it's told without words, and is beyond words, now and always, and unto the ages 